have a minute? Oh. I'm on my way upstairs. IDJ wanted to talk with us about putting together a trailer using some of the footage you've been recording this past month. Take your time. I'll meet you by the elevator. Sure. No worries. Over here. Hey, Melanie. Are you ready? He's waiting for us. Yeah, I'm ready. I just watched some of your footage from this week. It's amazing. Blackbeard was mental. And we all got so excited that we started talking about this idea for a trailer about him. Maybe start with him drinking, talking to some pirates, telling a story. <laughs> and that's the literal trailer for Assassin's Creed 4. Then we cut to him <laughs> leaping across the deck of his boat and... Sorry, his ship, not boat. But jumping around the deck of his ship, swinging from ropes and fighting like a devil. I mean, obviously, we're gonna have to manipulate some of the existing footage to get it looking good, but it could be great. I'm getting a shiver in my timbers just thinking about That's it. That's literally the trailer. <laughs> Sorry. Like, look up the Assassin's Creed 4 trailer where it starts with Blackbeard talking about Edward. It's literally that trailer. Bonjour, ça va? I hope we're not late. No, you can go right. Hi, Melania, so you just walked in. I need a few minutes with you alone. Leticia is on the phone and we're discussing the Kenway project. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry about this. I'll call you when we're ready. Uh, sure. Should be long. Or is it sit there wait for John to talk? Hello? There he is. <laughs> Hello? Hey. Do you have a second? Uh, of kind of. You Head to the waypoint on your map. I have another job for you. I'd like to link all the cameras in the building to a central monitoring system, but most aren't calibrated correctly. Level 2 access. Another locked door. Not a problem. Voila! You now have level 2 security clearance. Not bad for your first few weeks. Find the camera control station. I'll update your communicator. Hack the camera control panel. Nice place. Okay, that's not it. Uh, this door. Hello there, Desmond. Ah, oh, this is an interesting security measure. It looks like you need to find the right combination of numbers to adjust the wave. Easy okay. enough, right? Pick a number selector, then change its value. Once you find the right combination of numbers, you should get access. Okay, so I need to find a target number. Oh, this is easy! Oh, this is easy. Okay, so I get... Okay, so the first number is your starting number. The second number is what the first number is going to be times by. And the third number is what that number is going to be times by. That's easy. It works. And if we want information on assassins or Templars or the observatory or whatever the fuck else interests us, Olivier, you will deliver it. Full stop. Uh -huh. I understand that, Leticia. I'm sorry if that came up wrong. We are not trying to be a bottleneck here, but we just don't have the resources right now to do two times the research. Finding that balance is your priority. Your entertainment products are simply a means to pay the bills for larger and more important work. That's the way the world works. Mm? Dirty money buys clean hospitals. You get it? We're on board, Letitia. Rest assured, we have our best employee working on this, but it will take time. That means you. Good. And thank you. The both of you. I look forward to seeing what you deliver. Until then, I'll see you at the shareholders meeting, Olivier. Looking forward to it. Bye-bye. It's a little too early for that kind of abuse, huh? Come on. So, what's next? We do as the lady says. Focus on the observatory. Assassin, Templars, crazy talk. I'm curious about this shareholders meeting, though. How about you break into Olivier's office and see if you can find his schedule? Oh, what? You don't like that idea? Well, how about I blow the fucking whistle on you, hacker? I own you! <laughs> what I mean is, 
I don't want to ruin your life. So, do as I say. Now. Fuck step you. Step over to the window. What window? What window? Down here? This window? Oh, hi. You can't waltz into Olivier's office through the front door, so I've opened another route. Up we go. Is... Did you know that Abstergo was run by Templars? Oh, yeah. Sounds like crackpot stuff, I know. But then again, the moon landing was faked, right? So, huh? anything's possible. Uh, is John an assassin? I mean, yeah. The reason I'm saying that is because if you believe... Right. Um... Oh, Either my God. Shut up. Or throw yourself off the terrace. Those are your options. Okay, I can't jump though. Um, so in Watch Dogs, there is a few, few, th few things that prove that Assassin's Creed is connected to the Watch Dogs universe. And with that in mind, that means the assassins are hackers, because instead of um, instead of just being able to find things easier, they need to be able to access the internet and stuff, and that's why they need to be able to hack so they could find things and find, you know, Templar things. Um. And since this guy, he could be a Templar for all I know. I'm not sure if the Templars hack. Uh, I believe they do. But the fact that he's trying to break into stuff on Abstergo, which is Templars, I think he's an assassin. But that's bad, because technically we're working for Abstergo, which means we're technically a Templar. Oh, well done, kiddo. Find his computer. Make it snappy. We're no worries, just shut up. Now. As the data moves... There are security programs constantly monitoring the data flow. You need to Ooh. sneak past them, or they will destroy your data and send it back home. Okay. I need to use the arrows. Oh god, that's annoying. Oh. I hate that. I hate this. I hate this game so much. I hated this when I played it on Xbox. Hated it now, too. Dumb. I'm so glad I didn't have to do it like eight times. <laughs> uh, to Melanie Lee May, Karma Neuron, Chloe Lesney, and Christopher Darby. Even um, Christopher Darby and Even Dean. From Olivia Garner. Date 6th of November 2013, 9.46. Salut! As most of you know, I'll be attending the Chicago shareholders meeting from the 15th to the 17th, and they'll want to see our progress with the Kenway line. The small amount of data we have already gathered is incredible, and we anticipate even more amazing finds in the near future. The events and people we have seen so far make us confident that the complete experience will be one of the most eye-opening explorations of piracy ever seen. It will take quite a bit of work to scrub the data of objectionable and classified material, but we already have some incredibly promising footage. At the same time, Abstergo Entertainment will soon be announcing a closed beta for our new consumer cloud interface app, sexy name forthcoming. <laughs> Edward Kenway's virtual pirate experience will be the first complete product on offer, and the first of its kind anywhere, an immersive, interactive pirate experience drawn from actual historical data. Internal tests of our consumer cloud app have been encouraging and we anticipate it will be ready in time for the next holiday season if everything goes according to plan. So this leads us to a broader question. What with other um what other experiences would we like to offer? What other historical periods and locations can we explore? Judging by our current rate of data retrieval, our capacity to produce and our understanding of consumption trends, executives at Abstergo Industries have given me the goal of producing one complete virtual experience per annum. In addition to small offerings as our research allows, this includes books, recording films, and any other transmedia offerings. A second related question um, is this, does hang on a second, um, does Sample 17 contain enough compelling data to sustain our current commitment to it, or should we make a request to Abstergo Industries for additional archive data? Remember the data from Sample 1 proved fruitful enough to complete our liberation product? It is very likely that research into Samples 2 th through 6 would bear surprising fruits as well. 
Thoughts? Okay, so this is from Melanie Lime. Hello all. Thanks for opening the discussion, Olivia. Just a brief heads up with how, where we stand now. I've been the Sample 17 project director for just over a year now, and my team and I have been able to cobble and up together a rough list of the most interesting time periods available to us through this um, sample, um, simple genetic and partially um, genetic sample. Remember this this is data that has already been fully or partially sequenced by Pistogan Industries. I'll try to be brief. 15th century, Italian Renaissance. 16th century, Ottoman Empire. 18th century, American colonies slash warfare independence. 19th century, New England and American Midwest. Matalino Line. 12th century, Holy Land says Crusades. 13th century, Egypt and Northern Africa. Um, 14th century, Ashik um, Ashikaga Shogunate in Japan. 18th century, French Revolution. 19th century, Napoleonic Wars, Taiwan. 20th century, Summer of Love, American Pacif um, Pacific Coast. Obviously, this is just a small sample of the op um, potential options. The number of ancestors any one person has is well above 30,000, um, after just 15 generations. So there could be many more surprises waiting for us within Sample 17. However, despite Sample 17's rich heritage, we should not limit ourselves to this alone. We have if we have concrete leads elsewhere, for instance, quite a few men from all sides of my family fought in both world wars, and I even have a great-grandfather who fought in the American Civil War, managed to meet President Lincoln a few times too. Going this route is a li little more costly and time-consuming, since the data is not already been sequenced, but it could be rewarding in this long run. In short, if anyone has confirmed uh, connections to an interesting historical events, periods, or cities, or knows of people who do, please share. I'll also be reviewing the past three decades of samples collected and sequenced by Abstoger Industries. I recently learned that one of the samples, number two I believe, participated in the trial of Gian d'Arc. So there's a nice lead right there. Mel. Okay, so there's pictures, and I'm guessing those are meant to be of those time errors. It's funny because this one is from the French Revolution, I believe, and that's Assassin's Creed Unity. <laughs> um, okay, so this is from Olivia Gunner. All good points, Mel. A word of caution, though. Sample 2 comes from the late Dr. Warren Vidic himself, collected at some point in the early 80s when he was a young engineer working at Abstoger Industries. So as tempting as Gian d'Arc ex um, experience sounds, I'm not sure Abstoger Industries would take too keen on letting us rummage around in Dr. Vidic's DNA. It's just a sensitive topic. For my own part, I'm related to Franchise Xavier Gano, Noda Quibus, historical and poet, exciting, right? A possible lead. One additional um, caveat. Let's avoid digging into any modern periods, example 20th century, unless we find something incredibly compelling, because as fun as World War II setting might sound, we do well to avoid any setting with vehicles, cars, motorcycles, helicopters, tanks, etc. Why, you may ask? Because our research has shown that memory imprinting in individuals is actually hammering the semi catanic state most people enter when driving from medium and long periods of time. And this makes data retrieval somewhat more difficult. In short, we don't want to go through the effort of coding extra animus features just for the sake of digging up, digging up memories of people driving around in cars. There are others and more efficient ways to experience that. OG. Uh, this is from Chloe Lesney. Olivia. <laughs> Quebec City is beautiful. But without pirates and ninjas or zombies, I'm not sure how well the story about a historian would sell. Also, keep in mind Sample 4 and 16 might be off limits too. While doing my own research last month, I caught wind of something exciting. Some exciting characters buried in these gene samples. But as long as I started digging, I was told by people far, far above me to stop. Very odd, but not surprising, I suppose. AE has a lot of active mil military contracts. And I assume these had something to do with that. I, don't pu I didn't push back. As far as my own, if anyone is interested, my great-grandfather was friends with Hemingway and Stein and Satie and Picasso when he lived in Paris in the 1920s. No action-packed adventures there, but historically interesting. Just throwing it out there. P.S. Chris, is our lunch meeting on site or off? Um, from Olivia Garner. <laughs> possible locations. Uh, possible locations. Yes, as much as I love the lost generation, I think our first few virtual experiences will need to be a little more action oriented so wars and major combat operations are all, always a good starting point or any periods of intense conflict really as for pirates ninjas and zombies we could easily accommodate the first two but zombies are a bit how do you say a historical too bad really okay so this is from christopher darby 
Um, okay, I'll offside. <laughs> okay. Um, my great grandmother, for instance, worked alongside Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins for many years during the Irish War for Independence. So I wouldn't be difficult for a sequence that small segment of my own genetic memories for our purposes. Olivia, actually, there is a factual base for zombies, or zombification anyway. Read Hurston's book on Hayati. Um, Hayati. The strange voodoo practice there. It may not be Hollywood style zombie magic, but it's creepy nonetheless. In Liberation, Aveline came into contact with voodoo hoogans. If we dug further into that, I wonder what we could find. Her mentor, Agate, was into some weird stuff. Offside, um, Kiao. I think that stands for, yeah, Chloe Lensley. Uh, Offside, there's a new vegetarian place I want to try. I'll bring the spec sheets, they're already printed. Uh, this is from Carmen Nero. Sorry to be a dissenter, but couldn't we be using the technology to educate, not placate? I mean, theoretically, we have all the human history to explore, all of our achievements and brightest moments, so it's a little disheartening to hear we need to focus on wars and conflicts and violence. It's not that I'm against violence, per se, it's just that the violence isn't terribly interesting in bulk. That's all. There is so much more, more nuance to life, and I think we could explore that. So what if we found the memories of someone who worked with Albert Einstein in his patent office, or Charles Darwin in the Beagle? Or Mary Q in France. Moments when humans showed their very best potential. Um, date the 7th of November. So that's like a day later. This is from Even Dean. Okay, come on. Until oily, humorless university professors start paying us eight-figure fees to research the reification of normative gender sing um, signifies in pre-colonial India, why don't we stick to shit that sells? I'm talking Jack the Ripper in Victorian London, which is syndicate. I'm talking about guillotines, Robert Spira, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte in the French Revolution. I'm talking about Billy the Kid and Wyatt Earp in the wild American West. I'm talking about Genghis Khan and the Mongulus killing a city of millions in the span of long summer. Or weekend. Action, blood, adventure. Conflict. Because we're not going back to one out of tenth of the money we have poured into this reliving the memories of the guy who sat next to Einstein as he bit his nails while working out the finer details of general relativity in his head. For fuck's sake, man, this is a business, not a group therapy. Um, even, let's take this offline. <laughs> yeah, okay, that was actually pretty interesting. You sneaky bastard. A pirate through and through, ain't you? Now, get down to the lobby. There's a courier waiting. Yeah, that's right. I've been planning this for a few hours. Now, wait. What? The receptionist. Hold on. I'll try something. What? What? As gullible as ever. Now, hurry down to the lobby before I remotely detonate your earpiece. <laughs> I'm gonna hack this. Damn it. As I said, I really hate these. Mainly because they're so annoying. Oh, god damn it. You're fucking kidding me. Really? Okay. I can't be the only one who hates these. Honestly, I just can't be. Why, Ubisoft? Just why? I don't see why you had to put this in. Like, I get it. Hacking's meant to be hard. But really, Ubisoft? Really? Oh my god, fucking hell. <sighs> oh boy. Yep, I failed that miserably. Now see why she's the uh secretary. You don't you don't fuck with the secretary of a very rich business. 
guess that's what this game is teaching me right now. Oh my god. There we go. <sighs> Bypassing standard security protocols. Connection successful. So what did she say? Ooh! Livia Bowden, Chapter 3. Okay, time for more reading. She was in the old Shilag- um, Shilala- um, Shilalaga. Shilalaga. Shilalag. Shilalag. A tavern halfway between Hartherton and Bristol. A regular haunt of mine, sometimes in the summer when mother and father toiled over the shearing at home, when I'd have to make more regular trips in the town than several times a day. I admit I hadn't taken much notice of her at first, which is unusual for me, because I like to pride myself on knowing the exact location of any woman nearabouts, and besides the Shilalaga wasn't exactly the sort of place you expected to find a pretty woman. A woman, yes. A certain type of woman, but this girl I could see wasn't like that. She was young, about my age, and she wore a white linen coif and a smock. Looked to me like a domestic. But what made me aware of her wasn't her clothes, it was the loudness of her voice. She, which was quite in contrast to the way she looked. She was sitting with three men, all of them older than her, who I recognized at once. Tom Cobley, his brother Seth, and Julian. Somebody whose surname escaped me, but who worked with them. Three men with whom I had traded works, if not blows. Before, uh, the kind who looked down their noses at me, because they thought I looked down my nose at them. Who liked me no more than I liked them, which was not a lot. They were... They were sat forward on the stools and watching this young girl with leering, wolfish eyes that betrayed a darker purpose, even though they were all smiles, banging on the table, encouraging her as she drank dry by a flagon of ale. No, she did not look like one of the women who usually frequented the tavern, but it seemed that she was determined to act like one of them. The flagon was about as big as she was, and as she, was, as she wiped her hand across her mouth and banged it to the table, the man... The men responded with cheers, shouting for, um, for another one, and no doubt pleased to see her wobble slightly on a stool. Probably couldn't believe their luck. Be pretty little, th um, little thing like that. I watched as they let the girl drink yet more ale with the same tumult accompanying her success, and then as she did the same as before, and wiped her hand across her mouth, but with an even more pronounced wobble, this time a look passed between them. A look that seemed to say, the job is done. Tom and Julian stood and they began in their words to escort her to the door. Because you've had too much to drink, my lovely. Let's get you home, shall we? To bed, smiled Seth, thinking he was saying it under his breath even though the holts haven't heard him. Let's be getting you to bed. I, pa I passed a look to the barman, who dropped his eye and used his apron to blow his nose. A customer set down the bar from me turned away as I appealed to him with my eyes. Bastards, might as well have looked to the cat for help. I thought then, with a sigh banged down by tankard, stepped off my stool and followed the cobblers into the road outside. I blinked as I stepped from the darkness of the tavern into bright sunlight. My cart was there, roasting in the sun beside it, another one that I took to, um, to belong to the cobblers. On the other side of the road was a yard with a house set for black, far back. But no sign of a farmer, we were alone in the highway, just me, the two cobbler brothers, Julian and the girl, of course. Well, Tom Cobbler, I said. The things you see on a fine afternoon. Why just you and your cronies are getting drunk and getting a poor defenseless young woman even drunker. The girl sagged as Tom Cabley let it go of her arm and turned to address me, his finger already raised. Now you just stay out of this, Kenway. You young good-for-nothing. You're as drunk as I am and your morals just as loose. I don't need to be given a talk to by look likes of you. Seth and Julian had turned as well. The girl was ble glazed over like her mind had just turned in for the night, even if her body was still awake. Well, I smiled. Loose morals I might have, Tom Cabley, but I don't need to pour ale down a girl's throat before taking her to bed, and I certainly don't need two friends to help me at the task. Tom Cabley reddened. Why, you cheeky blood, old bastard. You, I'm gonna to put her in my cart, is what I'm gonna do, and take her home. Wait, there was no thing at the end of this, so... Okay, that's a typo. Um, I have no doubt that you intend to put on your cart and take her home. It's what you plan to do between putting her on the cart and reaching home that concerns me. 
That concerns you, does it? A broken nose and a couple of broken ribs will be concerning you unless you mind your own bloody business. Squinting, I glance, I glance at the highway, where trees bordering the dirt, tracks shone gold and green in the sun, and in the distance was a lone figure on a horse, shimmering and indistinct. I took a step forward, and if there had been any warmth of humor in the manner, then it disappeared now. Almost of its own accord, there was a stillness in my voice when I next spoke. Now you just leave that girl alone, Top Cable, and I won't be responsible for my actions. The three men looked at one another. In a way, they'd done as I asked. They let the girl let go of the girl, and as she seemed almost relieved to slide it to her haunches, placing one hand on the ground, looking at us with all the with all, at, looking at us all with bleary eyes, of evidently obvious to all this with was being discussed on her behalf. Meanwhile, I looked at Coblay and weighed up the odds. Had I ever fought three at once? Well, no. Because if you were fighting three at once, then you weren't so much fighting. You were getting beaten up. But come on, Edward Kenway, I told myself. Yes, on the one hand, it was three men, but one of them was Tom Coblay, who was no spring chicken about my father's age. Another one was Seth Coblay, who was Tom Coblay's son. And if you can imagine the kind of person who would help his father get a young girl drunk, well, then you can imagine that sort of person Seth Coblay was, which was, to say, a maggoty, underhand type, more likely to run away from a fight with rep preachers than in stand his ground. What's more, they were drunk. On the other hand, I was drunk too. Plus, there Julian, who going on looks alone, which is all I could handle myself. But I had another idea. That lone rider, I could see him in the distance. If I could just get a hold of the Coblaze till he arrived, the odds were likely to shift down in my favor. After all, he was a good character. The lone rider was bound to stop and help me out. Well, Top Coblay, I said, you got the advantage over me. That's obvious for anyone to see. But you know, I just wouldn't be able to look my mother in the eye, knowing I'd let you and your cronies abduct this pretty young thing. I placed, I glanced up the road to where the young, um, lone rider was getting closer. Come on then, I thought, don't hang about. So I continued. Even if you end up leaving me in a bloody heap by the side of this here road, and carry that young lassie off anyway, I'm going to have to do all that I can to make it as difficult for you as possible, and perhaps see to it that you go on your way with a black eye and maybe a pair of throbbing bollocks for your troubles. Tom Coblay spat and gazed at me, th um, though wizened. Slitty eyes. Well, you were just going to stand there talking about it all day, Edward Kenway, or are you going to tend your task? Because time awaits for no man. He grinned an evil grin. I've got people to see, things to do. Aye, that's right, and the longer you leave it, the more chance that poor lassie has of sobering up, huh? I don't mind telling you I'm getting tired of all this talk, Kenway. He turned to Julian. How about we teach this little bastard a lesson? Oh, one more thing before we start, Master Kenway. You ain't fit to shine for your mother's shoes, you understand? That hit me hard. I don't mind admitting. Having someone like Tom Coblay, who had all the morals of a fronting dog, and about half the intelligence, able to reach into my soul and, if my guilt was on an open wound, then stuck his thumb in that open wound and caused me even more pain. Well, it certainly firmed up my resolve, if nothing else. Wait, what did he say? And one more thing before we start asking why you ain't fit to shine your mother's shoes. Okay, I'm not fit with their time, so I'm not sure how that's an insult. I know what shining shoes are. I know that um, in the olden days, people used to pay others for shining their shoes, but making him not fit for it, I don't know how that's an insult. Sorry. Julian pushed his chest forward and with a snarl advanced, two steps away from me. He raised his fists, dipped his right shoulder and swung. And I don't know who Julian was used to fighting outside taverns, but somebody with less experience than me, that's for sure, because I'd already taken note of the fact that he was right-handed, and he couldn't have made his intentions more obvious if he tried. The dirt rose in clouds around my feet as I dodged easily and brought my own right up sharply. He shouted in pain as I caught him under the jaw, and if it had just been him, the battle would have been at one, but Tom Coblay was already upon me. I just saw him out of the corner of my eye and it was too late to react, and I was dazed by a fist that slammed into my temple. I staggered slightly as I turned to meet the attack, and my fists were swinging much more widely than I'd have liked. I was hoping to land a lucky blow, needing to put at least one of the men down to even the numbers, but none of my punches made contact as Tom Coblay retreated. Plus, Julian had recovered from my first punch with alarming speed and now came at me again. He swung at his right hand connected to my chin, spinning me about so that I almost lost my balance. My hat fell off, my hair was in my ears, eyes, and I was in disarray. 
And guess who came in with the brutes kicking? That worm Seth Cablay, shouting encouragement to his father and Julian at the same time. And the little bastard was lucky. His boot caught me in the midriff, and already off balance, I lost my footing and fell. The worst thing you can do in a fight against three men is fall. Once you fall, it's over. Through the legs, I saw the lone rider up the hallway. Highway. Now my only chance of salvation, possibly my own only hope of getting out of this alive. But what I saw made my heart sick. Not a man on a horse. A tradesman, who would dismount and come rushing to my aid. No, the lone rider was a woman. She was riding astride the horse, not side, sa not side saddle. But even though the lady, even though was a lady, she wore a bonnet, a light-coloured summery dress. And the last thing I thought before the cobbled boots obscured my vision and the kicks came raining in was that she was beautiful. But beauty wasn't going to save me now. Hey, I heard. You three men, stop what you're doing right now. They turned to look up at her and removed their hats, shuffling in line to hide the sight from of me, who lay coughing on the ground. What is he doing here? She demanded to know from the sound of her voice. I could tell she was young and wild, not highly born, definitely well-bred. Too well-bred, surely to be riding unaccompanied. Well, we're just teaching this young man here some manners, rasped Tom Cablay out of breath. Exhausting business. It was kicking me half to death. Well, it doesn't take three of you to do that, does it? She replied. I could see her now, twice as beautiful as I'd first thought, as she glowered at the Cobblays, who for their part looked thoroughly mauled. Mollified. She dismounted. More to the point. What are you doing with this young lady here? Pointed to the girl who still sat dazed and drunk on the ground. Oh, ma'am, this is a young friend of ours who has had too much to drink. The lady darkened. She's most certainly not your young friend. She's a maidservant. And if I don't get her back home before my mother discovers that she's absconded, then she will be on an unemployed maidservant. She looked pointedly from one man to the next. I know you men, and I think I know exactly what is going on here. Now you will leave this young man alone and be on your way before I am of a mind to take this further. With much bowing and scraping, the cobblers clambered aboard their cart and were soon gone. Meanwhile, the woman dismounted and knelt down to speak to me. My name is Caroline Scott. Ooh! My family lives in Hawkins Lane in Bristol. Let me take you back there and tend to your wounds. I cannot, my lady, I said, sitting up and trying to manage a grin. I have work to do. She stood. I see. And did I assess the situation correctly? I picked up my hat and began to brush the dirt from it. I was even more battered now. You did, my lady. Then I owe you my thanks. So will Rose, um, and so will Rose when she sobers up. She's a willful girl. Not always the easiest of stuff, but nevertheless, I don't want to see her suffer for her impuishness. She was an angel, I decided then. And as I helped them mount the horse, Carolyn holding onto Rose, who lolled drunkenly over the neck of the horse, I had a sudden thought. Can I see you again, my lady? To thank you properly for when I look at a little more presentable, perhaps. She gave me a regretful look. I fear my father would not improve, she said, and with then shook the reins and left. That night I sat beneath the thatch of our cottage, staring out over the pastures as the sun went down. Usually my thoughts would concern either the possibility of escape or wrestling with the inevitably, um, inevitably, the inevitability of my future. That night I thought of Caroline, Caroline Scott of Hawkins Lane. That's how we met Caroline. Don't even think about ratting me out. My Shut up. Are covered. Yours ain't. Fuck you. <sighs> All right. decision here is under review. Are you kidding? Is this... Where the hell are you going? Get down to the lobby. I want to hack into this. So too bad. Ooh. That's interesting. A warp. Initiating extraction sequence. Hopefully it's not more reading. <laughs> oh, you're fucking kidding me. 
Uh, Antikythera mechanism. Originally assumed to be an analog computing device built for the purposes of determining the future positions of astral bodies. Of Stugger Industries, scientists have recently discovered that the Antikytherium mechanism is merely one small portion of a much larger tool, a so-called prognostication of the machine, thought to have been used by the first civilization to make probability-based predictions of future events. It has been confirmed, for instance, that our precursor, um, precursor race used to such a device in, in conjunction with their inherent precognitive pro abilities to locate and contact Mr. Desmond Miles, the source of the Sample 17 strand, for purposes that shall remain classified. It is also known that due to the nature of these quantum probability measurements, that such machines would have been exceedingly difficult to use, and that many hundreds of thought thousands of trials would have been needed to peak such a great distances into the future. Bagam Bagadad Battery mystery that has been puzzled scientists for decades. The Baghdad battery's ultimate secret has finally been discovered. This year, researchers at Abstergo Industries determined that these batteries contained, at one time, a synthetic pre um, precursor element capable of producing power by harnessing energy generated by the passage of time, eerily similar to what theoretical um, physicists have called time crystals. This unknown crystalline um, material was able to generate tiny, but unlimited levels of energy simply by siphoning energy from the passage time itself. Though minute, um, th though minute, the resulting power was likely enough to power a small LED, resulting in a humble but incredibly efficient means of producing light. The data functional precursor time crystal is not being located. Blood vials. Little is known about the function of these blood vials, though dozens have been found since Abstergo took an interest in the recovery at some point in the late 1980s. To date, only three have been found with their original contents, contents intact, and of these, only one contained a confirmed sample of precursor DNA. Abstergo Industries executives have expressed a particular interest in locating more precursor DNA, and, if possible, samples of our so-called mitochondrial Eve as far-fetched as it sounds, please take special care to identify any vials you might stumble upon in a memory replay. Unfortunately, as the average half-life of DNA is a mere 500 years, any sample old enough to belong to this either source, um, to either source, 80,000 years or more, will have degraded well beyond usefulness. We suspect it would require a minimum of over 250 similarly preserved samples and a hell of a lot of luck to sequence an entire precursor genome, though the true figure is probably closer to 500. All right. Crystal skulls. These ancient tools have been found on a few separate occasions at alleged precursor sites throughout the world. All the communication devices to some agree, although the three distinct varieties have been discovered so far. The first crystal skulls worked much like the mobile telephony devices we use today. These allow multiple um, multiple node communications between all who possess a working device. A second crystal skull was later discovered to have a record and playback function, meaning a user could record and send vi audio visual messages to multiple parties as frequently as he saw fit. A third set of crystal skulls discovered only recently seem to have acted as passive monitoring devices, much like televisions in a multi-camera surveillance system setup. As yet, the cameras on the opposite end of this setup have not been found. It and not be found. It is unclear why these communication devices were designed to resemble such a macabre piece of an anatomy, but we have no reason to suspect that our precursor race, as intelligent as they were, didn't occasionally fall victim to gaudy fashion. And last one, I think. Wait, is it? Oh no, it's second last one. Uh, memory seals. These devices, powerful in function but limited in scope, were used by the precursor first civilization to record brief memory impressions. impressions which could then be played back or re-experienced by another user at a later date. Judging by the scar um, scarity, scarcity, fewer than 40 have ever been found or encountered for. It appears that these seals were not wielded casually by the precursor race, but were intended for use only by the wealthiest and most powerful members of that society. To date, no seals containing records, recorded precursor memories have been found, and only a few have been known to contain any information whatsoever. The seals used by the assassin Elta Ibn Lahad to pass memory information to Ezio Auditori da Firenze are suspe suspected to be functional to this day, but as of this writing, their whereabouts are unknown. As a point of interest, it can be revealed that many of Abstergo's early breakthroughs in genetic memory technology came about through closer study of these artifacts, although current animus technology is not based on their architecture.
and Voynich Manuscript. A fascinating puzzle is yet unsolved. We are deeply interested in finding the person or persons responsible for their creation of this magnificent and mystifying tome. All researchers assigned to European suspe um, subjects living in the 15th and 16th century should be advised to pay special heed to any mention of this rare and valuable artifact, though recent carbon dating has given the manuscript a birth date of 1405 or thereabouts. Abstergo Industries has uncovered highly classified information that complicates this theory greatly. One suspect subject of great interest to us is, in this endeavour is the English philosopher Roger Bacon. Oh, I'm talking too much. Oh my god. God, my throat hurts. Okay. I need to see the map. Um. Okay, so there's quite a bit of computers I can hack. Why won't it come up with the map? There it is. I was going to say, like, where is it? I'm doing all this before the courier, just in case. Oh god, it's one of these again! No! Hopefully it's a little easier. My hands hurt from the other one. Ah, fuck. Okay, I didn't know why I did that. There we go. Access granted, extraction successful. Bypassing standard security protocols. Connection su successful. <laughs> More reading! No! <laughs> oh, oh, fine. Eleha Ghost Lights. It is the. It is. The opinion of the researcher that inadequate attention has been paid to the Southeast Asia, and in particular the Himalayas. Our research into first civilization peoples and the subtle fingerprints they have left throughout throughout left throughout through Oh my god, you fucking typos. Uh the world would benefit greatly from further investigations into this region. For example, we may find a prime example in the form of Alaya's ghost lights, often reported by fishermen. Is, um, that meant to be there? That asterisk? I don't know. Uh, the lights appear over marshes and possess the power to distract waylay, and even compel victims to drowning, but have also proven useful as navigation aids. Gas seems like too facile an explanation. Has genetic memories research yielded evidence of anything similar yet? Ghosts or gas or something else in the Himalayas, there is said to be the souls of deceased fishermen. We really don't take fishermen seriously enough, do we? How many times has a simple fisherman village yielded insignificant information, if not treasure? Bermuda Triangle. What must surely be the most intently studied region, whose very ex existence is routinely denied by official sources? The Devil's Triangle has been held responsible for countless vanished vessels, air fact, aircraft and ship alike, since the earliest days of sail. The region's techno, um, tech omnivorous, omnivorous, tendencies have been attributed to many magnetic pool of the lost continent of Atlantis, to UFOs and even to unnamed mysterious forces. While the area still holds much interest and we firmly believe in the power of science over superstition, we have been unlucky in researching this area, and can claim only to have contributed two small aircraft, a ship and several hundred thousand dollars of research equipment, to the hungry more of its continued mystery. For the time being, it may be safer to pursue greater knowledge of this region through genetic me memory research via the Animus program. Chichen Itza One of the most popular tourist attractions in Mexico today, Chichen Itza was, one, was once one of the largest cities of the pre-Columbian Maya civilization, boasting a mix of architectural styles from across the empire. It is also known to include contributions from members of the first civilization, believed to have fought on the front lines against the human rebellion. In particular, the technolog technologically advanced system of caves, tunnels, and puzzles that runs underground between the Castilla Temple and the um, Cenote Sagrado are rich with s first civilization artifacts. Excavated in the 18th century, in a controversial dig ordered by Madeleine de Lysel, 
these ranges these range from prophecy discs to rings and shards. Uh, voluminous in quantity, they are minor but culturally significant artifacts, which as a collection provide us with the best pictures we have of, we have of life on Earth in the months pre preceding the Toba catastrophe. The site is currently under federal protection, but we are close to reaching an agreement with the Mexican government. Easter Island. Located at the southeast, southeastern point of the Polynesian tr Triangle, Big Rapa is a home to the to some eight, 887 Moai statues created by the Rapa Nui people. One of the most isolated in, un, um, uninhabited inhabited islands, a territory of Chile, protected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It has proven difficult to study closely in this century. Some records are available from the 18th century when the Rapa Nui suffered a new eye, suffered from disease communicated by European sailors. 19th and 20th century records indicate slave trades, famine and um, famine war, and defor deforestation. Despite the rich and perhaps tragic history, it is the Moai stations that are most heavily protected, carved from the stone of an extinct volcano. It is not known how they were transported for insulation. These, this mystery fascinates tourists, but if we could gain access to conduct a private archaeological um, excavation of this island, it is the petroglyphs and network of caves established by even earlier civilizations that we believe would yield the most productive results. Lake Vostok Working with our Russian partners, we have secured an agreement to commence research into the subterranean lake and um, that rests deep beneath Vostok Station. In the lake accurately, if po um, poetically named, Pole of Cold, on the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, sitting approximately 3,500 meters above sea level, the fresh water lake rests 4,000 meters beneath the surface. A core ice sample was provided, um, was extracted in 2012, and will soon begin research that should provide a paleoclimatic pale record going back some 400,000 years. Isolated fossil water reserve samples may prove even older. Only time and science will tell what genetic marvels these magnificent samples will reveal, if not a new window into first civilization life itself. Lovely.